Okay, folks, I'd like to ask you all to take your seats so we can get going. So before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of what I'll call uh, ways to help us get through this hearing with the most efficiency and the most fairness that we can. Um, just relative to speaking order, you'll see that there's two microphones, one in each aisle. When I begin first, I'm going to call two names. One will be Representative Cleaver, he's the prime sponsor, he's going to introduce the bill. And I'll call the next person. I would ask the next person to go to that mic, or whichever one is open, so we're saving a lot of time in terms of people getting up from their seats, moving through people, and so on. And then when that second person is done, before he begins, I'll call the third person who goes to the other open mic. If we can do that, we can, everybody will have more time to be able to speak as they wish. Um, the reason I'm doing this also is because if I were to add only five minutes per card, then we have over two hours worth of testimony. I'd like to not have to take that long if we can, because it does, but this will help move so long. Now, next thing. Today, one thing I can predict is that people are going to make statements in their testimony that you may or may not agree with. That happens. That's why we call it a public hearing. Everybody gets their chance to talk. We do have something called the quorum here in the chamber. And the decorum is that there will be no outbursts of emotion, no clapping, just let people have their say. We're here to listen to everybody, so let's not, let's try not to do, get, um, depart too far from decorum. For the moment, I'm not going to use a timer, and you ask what that's about. In other hearings I've had this year where we had so many people who wanted to talk, I would set up the clock for only so much time per person, and once that came, I'd tell them, hey, you got to finish. I'm not going to start out doing that, but I'm going to ask you that you try and keep your remarks to five minutes. That five minutes and two hours is what I was timing on, so if somebody takes more than five minutes, we're going to start running later and later and later. When you do get your chance to speak at the mic, I would ask you that you introduce new ideas or new points that you want to make. We don't, if, if you feel that a certain item shouldn't be done, I think this is a bad idea because um, I don't want to put testimony in anybody's you know, voices, but if, it, if it's already been spoken about, I, you might say, I agree with the speaker the prior speaker, or something like that. You don't have to keep repeating everything if you can help it. Um, we've had hearings where I've had to listen to 43 versions of, I don't like this. And I got that, but let's see if we can be, be a little bit more efficient. And finally, if you have written testimony that you want the committee to have, I'd ask that you, when you come up, after you finish speaking, you can pass the written testimony to the clerk, but if you don't, not, not everybody is comfortable speaking in public. I happen to be one of them. I, I handshake when I have to speak in public. So if you have to read your written statement, okay, but I'd ask you, if you don't have to, take your written testimony, summarize it for us, and then turn it in and it'll become part of the official record. Okay? So. Just going to take one final look at the cards to make sure that I have them organized. Could you please close those doors back there too, Representative Nada, maybe? Oh, they got it. Okay. 
So the first speaker is Representative Cleaver, and the second speaker will be Representative Kirk. And by the way, if I butcher your last names, blame it on me not being able to read the card or whatever you want, I do the best I can. Call to order the public hearing for House Bill 1621 relative to the use of protective headgear while operating motorcycles and motorized bicycles. <coughs> Representative Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm very, very pleased that I wrote a bill that would engender so much interest in a legislative process. This is very interesting to have so many people at a hearing, and I think that's a good thing for democracy. This bill is about traffic safety and saving lives and preventing serious injury. I won't go through a lot of statistics. There are a lot that indicate, both from CDC and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, state traffic safety administration and so on and so forth that indicates that helmets save, save lives, save serious injury in, in, in billions of dollars saved in, uh, in losses of both direct economic and comprehensive losses. The facts are clear and they are indisputable. The question is, do we want to give up freedom, as some people see it, for the sake of preventing injury and death? To me, the ultimate freedom is being alive and being well and being able to enjoy life for an extended, long life and period of time. So, this is not intended to take away freedom, it's intended to enhance freedom and freedom from injury and, and uh, wrongful death. S states can save lives and save money by universal helmet bills. This is proved over and over again throughout the country. I don't, again, I don't want to go through all the statistics and bore you with that. But it's a proven fact. 40% uh, less deaths when wearing helmets, 69% less brain and nerve injury when we're wearing helmets, and those are the facts. I've introduced this bill to include mopeds and motorcycles. The original bill had bicycles as well. I want everybody to know that I've introduced an amendment that will eliminate bicycles completely and totally from the bill. So their bicycles are not included in any class at all in this bill as, as it goes forward with, with amendment. So it's only motor, motor, motorcycles, mopeds, and motorized scooters. There are myths about helmets, one of which is that it adds more a likelihood for neck and cervical injury. This is not true. It is proven not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Motorcycling is inherently somewhat more dangerous than driving a, a four-wheel vehicle because of the nature of it. For miles driven, Motorcycles are 27 times more likely to be involved in a crash than, than a, a standard vehicle. So how do you protect yourself from the most serious injuries? Protective gear, including helmets. Again, this is for safety and enhancement of safety on our roads. Last year that uh, data was available, there were 4,985 4, deaths from motorcycle crashes. 1,866 of those were individual crashes, one vehicle. 
Road safety is the responsibility of everyone, including all drivers, to be aware of motorcycles. So safety has got not only the motorcyclist, but every, everybody who drives in the vicinity or around motorcycles has to be as safe as possible. And with that, I conclude. And uh, it's all about safety and saving lives. I, I realize the desire for sun and, sun and wind in the face and hair, although I don't have hair myself. I, I do realize the desire. It's just a matter of trade-off and statistics and what you want to take a chance on. So, thank you very much. Representative Cleaver, will you take questions? And I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Representative Klein-Knight. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Cleaver, for taking the question. Um, do you know approximately how much the state had to pay last year? No. Um, we're going to need to figure out that data to effectively vote on this, and I uh, request that, if that's okay with the Chair, to... Yeah, that's fine. We'll see if someone from the Department of Safety or whomever can get that answer for us. I have national numbers. I don't have any state numbers. Sorry. And folks, I'm going to ask that make sure your phones are on silence so that we don't hear them. Any other questions for Representative Cleaver? Representative Walsh, I see you're in next. surprised to hear you had an amendment to remove bicycles. I actually saw an email that might have spurred that on saying that the bicycling community is more, they think it should stay an option. They think they should have their choice. I'm just wondering why you don't feel that motorcyclists should have that same choice. Well, obviously motorcycles are much more powerful and have faster speeds and so on and so forth. And motorcyclists already have equipment necessary for use including helmets as they drive across the border. Bicycles are a different class of, although I personally believe that everyone should wear a helmet while riding a bicycle, I think that that's a, a different kettle of fish and totally different, although parallel, it's a lot different. For example, a lot of, uh, a lot of poorer people have bicycles to get around from place to place and might be an undue burden to buy an expensive home. I have Representative True next. Representative Tarosia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking the question. On the prior question, um, it came up that um, it was okay to remove the requirement for bicycle riders to wear a helmet. Are you aware, statistically, nationwide, that it's more dangerous and more risky to 
ride a bicycle than a motorcycle in public. Yes, road. it is. Not nearly to the extent of motorcycle injury, but there's a proven fact also that bicycling uh, prevent uh, helmet use during bicycling prevents a lot of injury. Proven. I have Representative O'Brien next. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Uh, in the seatbelt law, we were in the past going to receive money from the federal government in complying with the uh, restraining. I don't know if that's still available to the state, but anything in this bill will bring us into compliance with federal regulation that the state can receive any money from the federal government? I'm not aware of any reimbursement from the federal government, although almost all states have helmet laws and universal helmet laws. We're one of the very few. Representative Packard is next. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I like to go back to the bicycle thing because it is a proven fact that helmets are only effective up to a certain miles per hour. So I, I, I question again, why would you want to remove bicycles when they could probably be more effective than on a motorcyclist. And, and just for your general knowledge, Representative, there's 29 states in this country that have modified helmet laws that are, don't have any helmets at all. I'm sorry, I think you said 29 states don't have helmet laws? 29 states have modified helmet laws of some nature where it's either 18 or over or 21 or over. I disagree with that number. That's a fact, that's a fact Representative. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt here. We'll not get into debates between witnesses and the committee. Um, make your points and then we'll move on and then be up to the committee later to determine how they feel about these things. Just, I wanna answer the other part of the question. Uh, it, it is true at any speed, I mean obviously if you get into ultra high speed, nothing's going to save you, but it, at any speed on a roadway, a helmet is useful for preventing injury, at any speed, period. I mean that's not me, that's a traffic safety. Any further questions? Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking the question. I always like to know scope for the target constituency as and who will be affected by it. So, does this just affect these folks and the personal decision they make? I don't ride a motorcycle. Does it also affect anyone else? It affects everybody to the extent that injury to one is a society issue and can be a cost to the society. Generally, the the biggest responsibility is with the rider and with their family, and the biggest loss would be that. But it does affect the society at large, and including anybody who might be involved with the crash on the other end. You have a follow up, Representative Smith? Go ahead. Sorry, was that probably loud enough without the button? But I, I didn't quite understand your answer. Are you saying that a motorcycle rider not wearing a helmet is more likely to get an accident? I was a little fuzzy on no, that. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure about whether, whether you're more likely with a helmet or without to get into the accident. The point is that you're more likely to be injured without the helmet and more likely to die without the helmet. That's, that's the key. Not whether, not whether you're more likely to be in an accident in the first place. All right, thank you. Representative Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for taking another question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the cost of society. Uh, you mentioned safety. Uh, in doing my research, I know you don't want to get into statistics, that there are far more fatal head injuries in automobiles. And so if we're looking at the, just looking at the cost of society, why doesn't this bill also include helmets for everybody in any vehicle? Again, why just singling out motorcycles? Well, that's, that's a misnomer, actually. 
there's more injuries from head injuries in, in, in vehicles simply because there are many, many, many more passengers and, and drivers in vehicles as compared with motorcycles. Motorcycles themselves, there's more like, much more likelihood because there's no containment, exterior containment, they're much more likely to have head injury uh, as a result of a crash. So whether there's more vehicle uh, injuries or more motorcycle injuries, it's not a good comparison because there's far fewer drivers on motorcycles. Okay, so in an effort to move us along so everybody gets a chance, I'm gonna call Representative Knurk is next, but the person after him is Representative Ralph Bean. I'm not sure I said your name right, Representative, but Bohm. Bohm, okay. Thank you, Representative. Thank you very much. Representative Knurk. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Jerry Knurk, K-N-I-R-K, Carroll County District 3. And I wanted to say, first off, I wrote this testimony before my own uh, concussion that I sustained Friday when I was skiing. and. Uh, crashed and broke my helmet and had a 20 some minute period of amnesia. I'm glad I had a helmet on, but getting back to motorcycles, I really approached this bill from the point of view of both the uh, public health and the health economics. There really is ample data that uh, wearing a helmet and riding a motorcycle decreases the incidence of fatalities and of head injuries. And yes, we're gonna hear anecdotes about I would have been better off if I hadn't worn one or interferes with my vision. But that's been studied. NHTSA had a study that demonstrated that you can, there's no better, sorry, no detriment to hearing or seeing a vehicle in another lane by wearing a helmet. The primary cause of death in motorcycle injuries is a head injury. And although fatalities are troubling, the traumatic brain injury for, that we get from a head injury can really be quite devastating, lead to long term problems with cognitive ability and an inability to hold a job. And non fatal traumatic brain injuries really consume a significant amount of medical resources in the acute phase of treatment and patients with non-fatal TBIs also require rather extensive rehabilitation. Now, the question is brought up about other injuries and actually there has been some studies looking at that. In trauma, we use what's called an injury severity score where we can actually grade with the severity of injuries and that's because whenever you're doing any research, you have to make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. And even when controlling for the injury severity score, we still find that helmets provide a benefit. Now, many motorcyclists who don't wear a helmet actually never even make it to the hospital because they die at the scene. But for those who do make it, the cost of care for non-helmeted riders runs about twice as much as the helmeted rider. And the lack of helmet use is estimated to add $250 million to our U.S. healthcare economic burden. North Carolina has seven times our population. When they instituted a universal motorcycle helmet law, they saw a decrease of around $10 million in hospital charges just to the taxpayer-based based payer sources, like Medicaid. California's helmet law led to a reduction of 35% in total medical costs. Now, the NHTSA actually did a study looking at the economic burden of helmets, the lack of use of helmets, and they found that in 2013 in New Hampshire, they did it state by state, that if everybody had worn a helmet, the economic cost savings that has to do with medical costs and so on would have been $3.6 million. And the comprehensive cost savings, that includes other things such as lost wages and productivity and quality of life, would have been $25 million. Now, people who oppose this bill generally point to the right to make a decision about the risk they wish to take. But with that risk comes a responsibility. And not just a responsibility to yourself and to society, um, but to the cost as to society as a whole. The excessive costs of not wearing a helmet are not absorbed by the individual who makes that choice. When a motorcyclist involved in an accident arrives in the emergency room with a history of not wearing a helmet, the trauma team does not make the decision to not treat that person because of the motorcyclist's decision to not wear a helmet. We're trained to work hard to save lives, minimize disability. Besides that moral, ethical, and uh, humanitarian motivation, it's also illegal under the EMTALA Act to fail to care for a person who arrives in a hospital in need of emergency care. Michigan repealed their helmet law, allowing a person to go without a helmet if they have $20,000 worth of medical insurance. That's a laughably insufficient amount to cover the cost of a significant injury. But even if one does have insurance to cover the costs, those costs are still not borne by the individual who purchased that insurance. 
They're shifted to other people. That's how insurance works. They're shifted to everybody else's insurance. And also, it's important to realize that many non-helmeted motorcyclists do not have health insurance, so that automatically gets shifted in uncompensated care funds. Perhaps an compromise would be not to do what Michigan did, where they said you have to carry insurance, but where you might have a differential registration fee, where a person who decides to ride unhelmeted will simply pay a larger registration fee to register their motorcycle. That could be conceivably done as a compromise in this bill. Now, I want to go back to the bicycle use, because the bicycle use data is a little bit unclear. Some have shown no, no help, some have shown some help. One of the things that has been tossed about is perhaps a reason why they don't show a benefit is because bicycle helmets are nowhere near as robust as a motorcycle helmet, so they don't offer the same level of protection. And the injury patterns in bicyclists are perhaps a little bit different than in motorcyclists. I would acknowledge that some people get by only getting to work by their old uh, cast off bicycle they found in the dump and they can't afford a helmet. So it might be reasonable to exclude it, but it, not to exclude it just because you're giving them a choice, but because the economics don't demonstrate that it makes that much difference in bicycles, or maybe it should improve bicycle helmets. Now, in trauma surgery, we have our usual dark humor as all other places do. And in trauma surgery, we refer to motorcyclists with the bad moniker of donor cycles, because they do provide a lot of organs for transplantation when people come in brain injury, but that's not a reason to allow people to not wear helmets. We really should pass this bill to save the state a significant amount of healthcare dollars and lost economic productivity in addition to lives. Thank you. Will you take questions, Representative? Of course. I have Representative St. Clair first. Thank you. Um, are you aware what the largest cause of head injuries are in the state of New Hampshire? I'm not quite sure I know what the answer to that is, but enlighten me, please. Okay, I, I won't tell you if you don't know. Uh, and, and also, uh, knowing that there are head injuries in motor vehicles, with or without a seatbelt, and knowing that those inevitably will cost somebody down the road, whether it's the insurance or whatever, would you be in favor of having a mandatory helmet law for people in motor vehicles? No, but I would favor mandatory seatbelt laws because that actually helps to minimize a great deal of the head injuries from ejection. That wasn't my question. I understand, about helmets. but I'm not sure we have enough evidence uh, that helmets would make a difference for a rider inside of a vehicle if they were properly belted with an airbag. I have Representative Klein Knight next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking my question, Representative. Um, in light of the fact that we don't really have much data that the state had to pay out on these in on these accidents, you said from two, 2013, 3.6 million to the state they had to pay out for these accidents. Is that correct? Well, that's what was, I mean, an HTSA study of the economic burden of failure to use helmets, and it was not from 2013, but that's when the data was from, they found the economic costs were 3.6 million. I think that included healthcare costs, cost of um, ambulance services, cost of all kinds of things like that, but it doesn't include lost productivity and wages. Could you try and get us the most recent data for, for that? I could not find anything which was for the current year. That was, that, I mean, you remember that a lot of this data is gathered in the past, then it's studied, and then it gets published. And so almost all healthcare data and so on is usually a couple of years behind because they have to have go on data that's been gathered previously. Follow up? I'm going to limit it to one follow up, Representative. We're going to move along. Maybe there'll be someone else you can ask that question to. Okay, um, thank you. Is anyone else who has not had a chance? Representative Walsh is next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Representative, for taking my question. Um, motorcycle helmets, from my research, are tested at about 17 miles an hour. That's what they do their testing. Um, in doing other research on it, I've learned that, according to the opinion of most, the majority of fatalities are caused by acute internal hemorrhage, meaning that at X amount of speed, there is no shock absorber is going to do anything. In your statistics, talking about the cost to society, does it separate out the people that did die from acute internal hemorrhage uh, and wouldn't have been saved by anything? Yeah, yes, what they were looking at is 
Uh, if you took the percentage of people who would have survived because of helmet use, then what was that cost? And again, it has, that study has been done looking at normalizing injury severity score so that we are comparing apples and apples and helmets are still effective even there. So it isn't that we always are gonna simply die. The RD-17 is absolutely correct. And if you have an accident at 65, the question is, will you decelerate to 17 by the time you actually strike something with your head? So it's important to realize that those numbers, the same with ski helmets, bicycle helmets, all of them, they don't protect us with a straight on head injury at 65 miles an hour, but they can, most of the time, by the time we're flying through the air or whatever, by the time you land, we may be slowing down. I have Representative Smith next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my questions. I'm trying to get my head around the numbers that are in your testimony, and they cite some other states, uh, like Michigan, I suspect, must work radically different than New Hampshire, because I'm sure you're aware of New Hampshire, health insurance doesn't cover accidents, cost liability insurance does. So of these numbers, uh, you said the California helmet law led to a reduction of 35% in total medical costs, but it doesn't break it down for taxpayer-based sources. Do you have that breakdown, and can you identify what the taxpayer uh, pay your sources were? No, I do not. And again, ultimately, that really doesn't matter because whether it's from a taxpayer source or whether it's from your insurance, we still end up paying. Because that insurance, it's the same as all aspects of healthcare. Costs that get shifted are still paid somewhere. We don't have a tooth fairy that pays these things just because you have insurance. It comes from all of us. It either comes through taxes, public, or it comes through your insurance, private. Same effect. Right. Does anyone else have a question for this witness? <clears throat> All right. Seeing none. Next witness is Representative Nader, and after her it would be Representative Baruti. So, Representative. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Nader. Cut you right off. Representative Nader's after you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Transportation Committee. For the record, I am Ralph Bowen, and by the way, I already passed out my testimony. State Rep from Litchfield, Hillsborough District 20, and I am speaking against this bill. I'm not representing any organization, but I do ride a motorcycle. I belong to a number of motorcycle groups, including the Patriot Guard. We do motorcycle escorts for veterans and flag lines to funerals and cemeteries. We also do parades, ride-ins, and slow escorts. Having to wear a helmet in a parade or a slow light Slow motorcycle escort is dangerous. We ride at slow speeds in close quarters. An example of slow escort would be an honor flight. Helmets block sound and vision, preventing talking to each other if necessary. In parades and ride-ins, ride we interact with the people. A ride-in, for example, is when we ride into the Fisher Cat Stadium on Memorial Day. As for safety, we heard or probably will hear all about these statistics about motorcycle injuries, etc. My favorite quote from either Benjamin Israeli or Mark Twain is, there are lies, damn lies, then there are statistics. Statistics can be made to say anything you want. And to quote an old time radio show, now for the rest of the story. Of all the head injury cause of death, only 14 to 17 percent are caused from traffic accidents, including motorcycles and automobiles. Nearly 50% are caused by falls, like a bathtub, stairs, etc. And with all brain injuries, not by death, only 20% by traffic accidents. What about the other 80%? Maybe we should concentrate on that. We are responsible for our own safety. If we all want to be safe, we have stayed in bed and every day. Banned bathtubs, stairs, cars, etc., etc., all of which can kill you. What next? Do we ban riding with sneakers? Having to have a windshield? I better be quiet, maybe giving people ideas. Most of the motorcycle groups here do a lot of rides for charities. When you see a large group, it's probably a charity ride. We are not criminals, not Hollywood stereotypes, and a lot of people here ride with their spouses, either with them or, or on their own cycles. And I've been in a few motorcycle accidents, at least three. None of, which, none of which was a head injury. Broken ribs, messed up shoulder, foot, 
etc. I've ridden bikes from 80cc dirt bike to a 1600cc Harley Kawasaki Vulcan, and now 107 cubic inch Harley, which is about 1750cc. So please vote to allow us to keep our rights to protect ourselves. We do not need the government telling us how. And also, I go to Chicago every now and then to visit my granddaughter, and I notice there in the nanny state of Illinois, they do not have a helmet law. Thank you. You take questions, Representative? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions from the committee? Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Representative Nada will be next, and after her will be Representative Manjapudi. Representative Nada, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Four words. Live free or die. Let's not be a nanny state, and please vote this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Before you begin, Representative, Representative Baruti would be next after oh. you if you want to get to the... No, no, you're next, Representative Manager Baruti. Just getting Ms. Representative Baruti to line up for us so we can move things along. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the committee for listening. I am the representative of Lata Manjipuri for representing Ward 8 in Nashua. I have two. One, I have a constituent who has uh, submitted her written testimony in support of this bill. She herself is a female rider with over 50,000 miles of riding experience with zero accident. I'm not going to read the whole testimony. I'm just going to read the last two paragraphs. I suppose HB 1621, as a writer, I support HB 1621 as a writer and a driver. I support this law to make New Hampshire roads safer places to ride. I support this law because riders who gear up properly are more likely to be safer on the road. Um, most of all, I support HB 1621 for those on the other end of the fatal crash. I support this law because wearing a helmet is the smart way to ride and riding is the ultimate freedom. HB 1621 is not about taking away freedom, it's about enjoying freedom with less risk. And on my personal note, um, I have two grown children and my son who turned 25 and before that when he was 16 was in a uh, bicycle accident hit by a car but luckily he was wearing a helmet and he didn't sustain um, head injury but he had pieces of glass all over his face and hand that keep, kept coming out almost a year and fast forward 10 years later this young gentleman wanted to buy a motorcycle to enjoy his ride and he was down in Maryland and then moved up to Vermont as a mother I was dealing with, you know, vulnerable riders and the safety of the vulnerable riders, those kind of uh, bills. And when he made a commitment to have the helmet as well as the body protection armor, not just me, my husband and my daughter, who's his older sister by two years, felt a little more at comfort knowing that he was safe or at least was a safe rider. And the other promise he made to the family was that he wouldn't be riding on the highway, at least initially. And five years later, he sold the bike, and we are breathing safe. Thank you. I have Representative Baruti next, but after him will be Representative Baldassaro. Representative Baruti, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thanks for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I am Ben Baruti from Manchester Ward 4, 5, 6, and 7, Hillsborough 43. I know we have a lot of people here today, Mr. Chairman, that's going to talk about their own problems or their own thoughts about this bill, but I'm here in opposition to this um, for a couple of reasons. First, I don't think it was written well. And as far as me, I'm holding on to a microphone because I'm not steady on my feet, so I can't ride anymore. But when I was younger and I did ride, I never wore a helmet. A 
If I wore a helmet today, I'm also pretty deaf. I'd never be able to hear anything that's going on around me. But I really don't want to talk too much about myself. I want to talk about someone not here today. John Dale. A young man I met at the end of the winter of 1968, Fort Dix, New Jersey, as we went through basic training together. Now, when you go through basic training, you get to know each other. Get together seven days a week, 24 hours a day. John and I had discovered that we both had a passion for motorcycles. My motorcycle was my life. His motorcycle was his life. He was so proud to show me a magazine with his picture on the front page of a motorcycle magazine. So I had to beat him and tell him, I'm from New Hampshire, and I'm proud of New Hampshire. We have beautiful mountains. I go to the beach almost two or three times a week. I ride my bike all day. When everybody went home to go to bed, I went to work. When I got to work at three in the morning, I get on my bike and I go to the beach. I live five minutes from where I work, but I always took a ride around this Massachusetts Lake before I went home. So, as far proud as we were, the first chance we got was to head right down New York and go for a ride. Well, we didn't have a lot of time to ride, because when boot camp ended, we had to separate. I went to cook school, cook and baking school. He went to advanced infantry training. But we vowed that when this was all over, we were going to get together again and ride. And so we exchanged addresses. It was hard to keep a track of each other. But he wrote to me and told me where he was. I wrote to him. And then I didn't hear from him for a long time. I got a letter from someone who wrote a letter for John. He was in a hospital in Den Haag, pretty busted up. But in that letter he said, when I get home, I still promise we're going to ride. Took a while, almost a year, but I got a phone call. Hey buddy, it's me John. I'm coming to New Hampshire. Oh, you don't know how I felt. So John came with two of his friends. John was now riding a three-wheeler as he lost a leg and part of his hand. But I did show him. I took him to Hampton Beach and up the coast of Maine. And we cut across. We went and stayed in Conway one night and then across the Candomagans and stopped at every site there was. And he told me, New Hampshire's more beautiful than you ever described. We came back. We were only together for two days because he had to get back for treatments. When he rode off and I waved goodbye to him, I knew I'd never see him again. Sure enough, Less than a year later, John died. At the bright old age of 24 years old, last night when I was in bed thinking about this, I started thinking about everything I've done since I was 24 years old and everything he missed. So for my friend John and all the brave men and women who served, who fought, and who bled and who died around the world in the name of freedom. Let us not take anyone's freedom from them today. And if John could stand here next to me, I know he'd be standing proud, wearing his green beret and telling you that's what he wants to wear on his motorcycle. A beret that he earned, he loved, and he was proud of. He never took it off. He was even buried. So I ask you today, please don't take anyone's freedom because we fought for the freedom to live where we want to live, go where we want to go.
do what we want to do, wear what we want to wear, even while driving on motorcycles. Whether it be a helmet, a handkerchief, a Patriot's hat, or nothing at all. Please vote this in expedient to legislate. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Any, will you take questions, Representative? I sure will. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. The next person will be Representative Balsaro, and after him is uh, the Honorable David Booth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, fellow representatives. My good friend Ben, that's a tough one to follow there, and I agree with him 100%. As an old Marine retired first sergeant, who's not politically correct, this is a feel good legislation. This is a bill that comes every few years for somebody to try to take away the rights of our people. If you look in this room, there are many veterans that I know of, like myself, that have shed some blood, broke some bones, and many others that aren't here that made the ultimate sacrifice. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to read something here in the Constitution, uh, New Hampshire Constitution, Part First Bill of Rights. Article 1, equality of men, origin and object of government. All men are born equally free and independent. Therefore, all government of rights originate from the people is founded and consent instituted for the general good. The people have come. The people have came here to speak and let you know that they do not want this bill. Somebody else had had passed on to me there about heart disease is, is a bigger killer in the country, here in New Hampshire. Okay, every year the government should legislate how obesity and other things, uh, diabetes are causing killing, a death, versus wasting our time on something that is a freedom that people fought and deserve, that come to New Hampshire fall. New Hampshire is the third largest per capita of veterans. And I know many veterans like the Marine Corps League uh, Riders, the um, American League Riders, the Patriot Guard that come here because of the freedoms that New Hampshire has. I'm asking you all to put aside the emotions. I'm asking you to please take a look at the freedoms, okay, on personal responsibility that many of us Republicans and Democrats have fought for many years in this house to maintain. All of a sudden, now, we want to start taking away people's rights. Let's not do this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Questions? Thank you. Senator, before you begin, I just let the next person will be uh, Senator, the Honorable Bob Latona, will be right after you. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm here today to speak in opposition to House Bill 1621. And you know, the essence of why you are all here today and why we're all opposed to this bill is because it has taken away our freedom. And my good friend over here, he said it very, very aptly. You know, we, we go to war, we fight for our freedoms, and we don't need a legislative body taking our freedoms and our rights away. And you know, I served four years in the House, seven years in the Senate. And you know, we used to call this nanny legislation. You all know what nanny legislation is? It's nanny telling you what you can do and what you can't do. Nanny, you can go to the bathroom. Nanny, you can go out and play. But, <clears throat> so, members of the committee, please remember, people came to New Hampshire because they came here for freedom for their rights. Do not take those freedom and rights away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, very much, committee members. Please vote this bill down. Will you take questions, Senator? Sure. Members of the committee, any questions for Senator Boone? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. I have Senator Turno next, and after him will be the Honorable Mayor Paul Grenier. Go ahead, go ahead, Senator, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. 
Uh, for the record, I am Bob Paterno, former senator, former state representative. Uh, worked on the House Transportation Committee for eight years and was the chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee for, for, for four years. Six years, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you forget when you get my age. So that gives you a little background of where I came from and what I'm doing. Uh, I'm a lifelong motorcyclist and I'm still here. And so when I left my duties here at the state legislature, I got myself a job over there with the Department of Safety. And I was working in the motorcycle safety program. And during that time, I was invited to be the champion for the New Hampshire Strategic Highway Safety Plan. And when we did that, as you all know, we have to come up with a strategic safety plan every 10 years. So I'm just going to read with a short sentence here from the goals after we did all our work on that safety plan. Our goals was to reduce motorcycle crashes and improve crash data collection while improving education, training, and public awareness of vulnerable road users, leading to the elimination of fatalities and severe injuries for this group. Oh, by the way, I'm in opposition to this bill. In case you didn't notice that. So after that, I was invited down to Washington to testify before the House Transportation Committee for the bill that funds our highways for the next seven years. And I went down here on behalf of the Motorcycle Riders Foundation and the American Motorcycle Foundation. And I testified before the committee on the value of motorcycle safety education which we have an excellent program here in New Hampshire. The bill that they were looking at is where all the money comes from to repair our roads, our bridges, and other things. And I went down here to stress that we needed to have grants for the motorcycle safety programs throughout America. And at the end of my testimony, and I'm not gonna give you all of that because it takes too much time, I mentioned to the chairman of the committee, or in the committee, that in the first 15 years of the New Hampshire Motorcycle Training Program, we trained over 15,000 riders. And of those 15,000 riders, only one, just one, was involved in a fatal accident. The chairman looked up at me and says, say that again, and I repeated it. At the end of the day, when that program finally gets approved by Congress, New Hampshire, along with all other 50 states, qualifies for $100,000 a year in motorcycle training funds. You have to qualify, you don't just get it. And if New Hampshire has used that money wisely, we haven't used it all, but we used it wisely while we were, I was involved in that program. Buying new training bikes to provide materials for the riders, and it's been a great program. Motorcycle training saves lives. I'm here to talk about that. Helmets never stop the crash from occurring. Training does. They are trained. Anybody who's taken this motorcycle training will tell you that they had learned things that they didn't know. I took the program as an experienced rider and learned that I wasn't doing it right. And I'm still here because I learned that. Many times, things happen on the road, but you have to be aware of it and you have to think ahead of time to prevent that accident from occurring. Because whether you've got a helmet on or not, that accident occurs, you're in danger of losing your life. And we are responsible for our own safety. So, at the end of the day, I'm just going to mention that <clears throat> helmets don't save lives, education does. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the time that you've given me, and I don't think there's any need for questions unless you really want to. Thank you. Thank you. 
after the mayor, we'll have Jennifer Anderson if she could queue up. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, my name is Paul Grenier, and I reside in Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm also the mayor of the city of Berlin, and I also serve as a Coas County Commissioner. Uh, before I begin my testimony, I would like to uh, thank uh, Representative Packard and Representative St. Clair for your years of service with the motorcycle community. Uh, I, it's been, you guys do a fantastic job. I, I rise in opposition to this bill, and I've heard a lot of uh, economic statistics, why we should or we shouldn't, but I'm going to be brief. This is, our state motto is live free or die. And if this bill passes, this is what you do to the state motto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. After Ms. Anderson, I'll have, uh, I'm not sure, I think it says Henry, but Mr. Murphy? Is it Henry Murphy? Sorry about that. You'll be next. Go ahead. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Jennifer Anderson, and I'm a proud resident of the state of New Hampshire and a very proud motorcycle rider. I'm here today to speak in opposition of a mandatory helmet law, HB 1621, both personally and professionally, as the deputy director of the Laconian Motorcycle Week Association. Personally, I believe motorcycle safety comes first from education and experience, and even with both, accidents will never be completely avoided. Rider education, both formal and informal, teaches us to keep a safe distance from other two and four wheel vehicles, to ride at an appropriate speed for the road and weather conditions, and to never ride distracted or impaired. Experience teaches us to ride defensively, mindful of animals darting out into the road and other vehicles taking a left-hand turn in front of us or crossing the center line. No amount of safety equipment will compensate for education and experience. I'm in opposition of mandatory helmet laws, though I fully support any rider's choice to wear one. Professionally, I have worked for the Laconia Motorcycle Week Association for well over 20 years, and throughout that time I've conducted hundreds of surveys with responses in the tens of thousands relating to all aspects of the rally and our visitors. Our efforts are year-round, marketing the state of New Hampshire to motorcyclists from the USA, Canada, and beyond. We know that a mandatory helmet law will negatively infect, impact the rally's attendance, just as the repeal of the Florida helmet law 20 years ago positively impacted Daytona Bike Week's attendance. As the oldest and one of the big three national rallies, we are fortunate to have long-standing relationships with rally organizers in Daytona and Sturgis, South Dakota. All three national rallies agree mandatory helmet laws decrease rally attendance. With an average of over 300,000 motorcyclists attending Motorcycle Week, two-thirds of our visitors are out of state, and the rally continues to be the largest multi-day event in the state of New Hampshire. Motorcycle Week has a tremendous impact on the state of New Hampshire's economy, especially considering that the event occurs before kids are out of school and before the peak of the summer tourism season. 80% of New Hampshire's general budget comes from taxes collected by the Department of Revenue Administration. The DRA collected taxes that are most impacted by the rally include rooms and meals tax, business taxes, and toll revenue. New Hampshire's toll revenue increases 13% on average during the rally compared to the other weeks in June. New Hampshire rooms and meals tax is the state's third highest revenue stream, totaling over $330 million for the year 2018. In June, just June of 2019, rooms and meals revenue totaled $28 million four million dollars higher than what it was the month before. Revenue collected by the DRA in June of 2019 totaled a whopping 196 million dollars, 
That's $196 million collected from June. In May, that figure was $84 million. And in the peak summer season of July, it was $96 million. June was double that from our peak tourist season. A mandatory helmet law will most certainly decrease attendance to the rally. Our visitors are our constituents, much like New Hampshire residents are your constituents. According to the federal DOT, the national average is one motorcyclist for every 36 people. In New Hampshire, it's one in 17. This means that each of you most likely represents many motorcyclists in your district. Time and time again, visitors and New Hampshire residents who ride tell us they oppose such a law. Just this past weekend, our association attended the International Motorcycle Show in Cleveland, Ohio. This show averages an attendance of over 60,000 people in two and a half days. News about today's hearing in little old New Hampshire made its way through the national motorcycle community very quickly, and people certainly made their way to our booth to tell their opposition about it. In addition to those that we spoke to at the Ohio show, we've spoken to hundreds of riders over the last couple of weeks to ensure them that their rally, the oldest in the country, would continue to welcome all motorcyclists and do our part to advocate on their behalf in opposition of a mandatory helmet law. I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I would like to also enter my testimony for the record. So, uh, after the questioning period, if you bring your testimony down, I'll give it to the clerk. Go up and around would be great. Any questions for this person testifying? All right, seeing none, thank you. One second, sir. I'm going to have Christine Corey line up next. All right, um, Mr. Murphy, was it Murphy? Did I get that? Right? Herb Murphy. Okay, Herb. My name is Herb Murphy. I'm a 14 year member of the Regional Officer of the Soldiers of Jesus Motorcycle Club. I am a member of the New Hampshire Motorcycle Rights Organization, United Bikers of Maine. I sit on the PI Committee for the National Council of Clubs and just recently became the Northeast Club Rep for the MRF. I reside in my life in Hoop Bay Harbor, Maine. I'm not even from New Hampshire. And uh, I was born there 61 years ago, and I'm still there today. With grandchildren and all that goes on in Maine, my wife and I sometimes find it hard to get away when we do. The last thing I want to see is a lobster boat or a lighthouse. And uh, so we most often come in New Hampshire. Number one, your roads are way better in New Hampshire than they are in Maine. We don't have a Canyon Mangus Highway. We don't have a Mount Washington Valley. We don't have North Conway. We don't have uh, Laconia. We don't have a Franconia Notch. So when we can break away, my wife and I, we love to come to New Hampshire. We just love this state. And, uh, when we come, we generally spend the night, we buy our gas here, we buy lodging here, we buy food here, you have great restaurants and all that and everything. And uh, so my, my whole thing is, and it's, just, it's not just me, I don't think there's a motorcycle ride in the state of Maine from Kittery to Presque Isle that hasn't heard of all those places I've just mentioned, and that they don't come here probably at least once during the course of the year. And not just Maine, but I'm wondering about Massachusetts and Vermont. Those men and women in this room today, that they love to come here because you're naturally beautiful. You have something, I've traveled all over the United States, and when you leave New Hampshire, the next place you'll find any place as beautiful as New Hampshire is North Carolina, the mountains down in the Smokies and stuff. They're the only other people that have it. So what I'm asking today, if it's a financial thing, and I'm not, I'm not threatening nobody, I'm not to say I'm never going to come to New Hampshire and get a visit. I, I don't know that I could do that. But what I'm saying is when I leave Booth Bay Harbor on a warm summer morning, I don't want to have to pack up helmets and when I get to Freiburg, I'm strap them on the top of my head to supposedly <coughs> enjoy the weekend. What I'm asking you is not to turn me and thousands of others like me in Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts away from your borders. Let us come here, let us not wear helmets. I don't, we don't wear them in Maine. And let us come here and let us spend our money. Yeah, I, I just thank you for that. Um, if, if, if it's about finances, I'm, I'm just, as this young lady just spoke, I can't imagine how much revenue would be lost this year with Tony if, if this bill was to pass. Um, anyways, there was something else, and I'm not 
public speaker, so I lost it. All I know it was, and if it's a statistical thing, and I'm not trying to maybe it is funny, I hope you take it the right humor, but I checked on it, and last year in the United States, more people died with intestinal bad guy. That's constipation. <laughs> and lost their lives on motorcycles, but I don't see anybody trying to pass an annual floor against that as well. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. <laughs> Sir, would you take a question from the committee? Representative St. Clair, you had a question. Thank you, I just want to be uh, clear about this. So in your estimation, on a summer day, if you guys decide to go out for a ride, chances are if this bill is enacted in the law in the state of New Hampshire, you more than likely would not be riding into the state. I, I would probably, we also own land in range we think we probably go to range we agree. I'm not, I, like again, I'm not threatening nobody. I love New Hampshire. I'm sure it will come, but it would be a consideration, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. After Ms. Corey, we'll have Edmund Smith. So if you could line up on this mic here, I'd appreciate it. Edmund Smith. Ms. Corey. Hello and thank you. Tell us who you are and where you're from. My name is Christine Corey, and I reside in Sunken, New Hampshire. I am a relatively new in the scope of things, um, new motorcycle rider. I did take the course that was offered by the state of New Hampshire, and I thank you very much for offering that course for us. The reason is, is that not only does it teach us to operate a motorcycle, that's a gift, but it also teaches us how to be defensive. Why are we defensive? Because every time I get on my motorcycle, I'm not worried about me, I'm worried about everybody else. I get on my motorcycle with the idea that everyone's out to kill me. I mean, true, because they don't see us, they don't whatever, they're not paying attention. It doesn't matter what it is, whether you're on the highway, whether you're on the back road, whether you're trying to even get out of your freaking driveway. It's horrible. But the whole thing is, why would I be here standing here before you today? Is because it's our choice, our choice. Everybody has said it, but it is about our choice our right to decide if we want to wear a motorcycle helmet or not. For those that want to, there's nothing saying that you can't. There's nothing saying that you can't. I've had somebody ask me, well, what about the seven that died in Randolph? I said, well, they had the right to either wear or not wear. That was their choice, their choice. My choice, this is my choice. This is what I usually wear. Unless I go, I know, it messes up your hair, but that's okay. That's okay. When I go to another state, riding that requires a helmet, we'll stop and we'll put helmets on. But it's our choice, and as soon as we get to a state that doesn't have a helmet on, we rip them right off and we bomb whatever or nothing that we want. It's our right. And so I ask you to vote no on this bill to allow us to have our way to decide how we want to ride. If we want to ride with a helmet, if we want to ride like the Michelin Man with everything wrapped up around us, we can do that too. And that might be the next bill coming up because you know, <laughs> you're trying to save this, but what about all down here? Let it be our choice, thank you. Thank you. So we have Mr. Smith next, and then after him, uh, Bill Murphy. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I'm, my name is Edmund Smith. I'm in Newport, New Hampshire. I've been riding for over 50 years. I'm also a member of the U.S. Veterans Motorcycle Club here in New Hampshire. Uh, past experience, I'll make it short and sweet. I've known many of people that have lost their lives because of that. I've witnessed a beheading where the helmet actually ripped the guy's head off. It happened, it was an accident, and if this was in a state that had a no helmet law, but he decided to, decide to wear his helmet. And I'll give you the state of this Colorado. I was 19 years old. I still ride without a helmet, though. It didn't bother me, I liked the freedom. 
There's many, many times that I've had friends that because of that helmet, they have brain injury. One guy, one guy, you can't even talk to him anymore. Another friend, same situation, helmet bounced around, wasn't on his head correctly, and it hurt his neck really bad and ruptured his brain. He's getting better, but he'll never be the same. So vote no. That's what I would do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, Going to probably have a problem with this name, and I apologize in advance. I'm looking for a Mo Shine, maybe. I got it right. Woo All right, you line up, and we have Mr. Murphy next. Yes, uh, my name is Bill Murphy. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm a lifelong uh, motorcyclist. <clears throat> I would like to point out, I'm, I'm a little disappointed to find out that I'm now referred to as a donor cyclist. I, I didn't think my writing was that bad, but I suppose it could be. Uh, to the rep who pointed out earlier that she wished her son would wear a helmet and avoid highways when riding, I suppose my 85 five year old mom would wish the same, just as she'd wish I'd eat my vegetables, but she recognizes I'm 62 years old and gives me the freedom of choice myself. Um, I would point out, I find it entirely hypocritical that represent, the representative sponsoring this bill supports an individual's right to freedom of choice where the taking of an unborn, unborn baby's life is concerned, yet sir, in the case of an adult motorcyclist, this is too serious sir, a complicated Sir, matter. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for a moment, please. Sure. A couple of things we don't want to be doing. One, we don't want to stray off into topics that are not germane to the bill. And secondarily, we try to avoid calling out specific persons whom we may have a disagreement with. All I'm pointing out is that I think we, we, should, we should be consistent where it comes to freedom of choice. Um, it, it's one thing to support freedom of choice relative to other issues that change your mind when it comes to something you disagree with. I'll just finish by pointing out one piece of data, and I have a link here, and I have copies of my, my testimony. The, Ham the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in a study published May 14, 2019, ranked each state by the number of residents per motorcycle. New Hampshire ranks second highest, with 17 people for every motorcycle, beating the national average by 53%. Yet when ranking motorcycle fatalities per registration, New Hampshire ranks as the sixth safest state with fewer fatalities than in every state possessing a universal health law. So given that, I would ask you to please vote this legislation in expedience to legislate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So after Ms. Shine, we have David Topham would be next up over there. Ms. Shine, please. Um, yes, my name is Mo Shine. I'm from Hampstead, New Hampshire, and I am um, part of the NHMRO, and I'm also on the board for the New Hampshire Patriot Guard Riders. Um, I am thoroughly and firmly opposed to this bill for the simple and basic <laughs> fact that all of us were given rights. Um, through the Declaration of Independence, we have the pursuit of happiness. Through the Constitution, the First Amendment. And finally, the state of New Hampshire's motto. We say it all the time, live free or die. Why would we begin to go down the road of Big Brother or in any state? I'm not sure. I didn't return to New Hampshire so we could have the lemmings and follow what other places are trying to do by making everyone wear a helmet, making everyone wear a seatbelt, just telling everyone what they're supposed to do when they walk out their door, or sometimes within their house. I think the thing that really bothers me the most is that we have the education here. The gentleman was talking about being in charge of the um, writer's course. I took it 24 years ago, and it was, it was the best thing I ever did. And one of the statistics that I remember all the time was the gentleman who was teaching the writing course said that as a, as a person who drives a car, you have to adhere to probably 700 or 800 extraneous things in any one given day time period. As a motorcyclist, you have to adhere to over 2,500 things. We are responsible for a lot of things, and we're responsible for our safety. You're not responsible for my safety. 
you don't tell me how not to slip and fall when I walk out outside my door. You're not there to tell me to put on my seatbelt. You're not there to tell me that I have to be careful when going down the stairs if I'm having my crutches. I'm responsible for all that. And for you all to think that with this house bill that you can take that away, I just, I don't know, I, I find that a little disconcerting. I choose to live free. I choose to live here. And I choose to live for the right to have freedoms. I choose to be free from restrictions to my hobbies and my interests and not to infringe on other people's rights. I choose to be free to choose my career, free to be a parent and not to be a parent, free to vote, and most of all, free to know how to make a decision about me and only me. I don't need your help. I just don't, not anymore. I shall continue to obey current laws and advise people with helmets if they want to wear them. I, you have the right to wear a helmet if you want to wear a helmet, but so be it. I wear helmets sometimes in certain circumstances, but not all the time. I would like for you all to stop treading on New Hampshire's motto, which all states admire, envy, and aspire to be. People are constantly saying, love that motto, I love the way you live, I love New Hampshire. They come here for a reason, they vacation here for a reason, they come to the rally for a reason, and that reason, that reason is to live free or die. So allow me the opportunity to live, and allow me the opportunity to pick my safety and die, if that's the point, because that's how I want to do it. I don't want to go out with my head in a basket. <laughs> so we have Mr. We have Mr. Topham next, and then after him, I have William Lynn Scott. Lynn Scott. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Topham. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. This is Dave Topham from Salem, New Hampshire. I just like to side off saying I am strictly a volunteer, I'm not a paid lobbyist, but I am a bicyclist. And as such, I have been actively involved here in the state of New Hampshire with both the Department of Safety, DOT, the bicycle community for 40 years. I currently serve on three state committees and commissions. I also represent six different bicycle clubs and organizations, safety organizations in the state. I was a little bit surprised to hear at the beginning of the testimony today, the hearings, that bicycling has been, bicycles per se, have been deleted from the bill. I'd just also like to point out the fact that e-bikes, of which there are currently three categories of classifications, are bicycles by state law and federally, as implemented last year with House Bill 148, for which I was one of the prime sponsors or advocates for that particular bill. So even though we're not talking of bicycles per se, I would just like to point out a couple of facts that I think are relevant to the discussion today, even ramping it up for how helmets fit into the basic scheme of things. As far as my so-called professional background, which was not paid, but nonetheless experience, I've been involved in education programs on a national level since 1980. I am a master lead cycling instructor. That's a League of American Bicyclists in Washington, D.C. I have trained well over 100, uh, 100 instructors here in, the, in New Hampshire, and thousands of students through schools up to adults and safe cycling techniques. One of my prime interests is being safety and education. How does it all fit together? But bottom line, the bicycling community, I'll give you a fact in a minute, we are opposed using the name of the Bike Walk Alliance of New Hampshire, headquartered here in Parker. We have five affiliates. The interesting point is, over the past two weeks, we conducted a survey monkey poll out to over 1,000 direct members and affiliates. The results were very interesting. We pulled out and closed the survey Sunday, two days ago. We had over a 50% response rate. You know how people like to take surveys, they want to ignore it. They basically get 10%, you may be lucky. We had over 50% response. And the quick numbers are, without getting this, and we'll be giving some written testimony up there so you have it for later. Made a reference. Nearly 60% of those responding to our survey said no to House Bill 1621 because we have been, it's been proven nationally that more people riding bicycles are on the road make the road safer for bicyclists and motorists by the sheer number, not mandating fewer people wear helmets because it's the law. 
I saw Norway this past year, 2019. You know how bicycling is, you know, so predominant in Europe in general. They had zero fatalities with no helmet on, and about 98% of the bicyclists do not wear helmets. So bottom line, we have the statistics, we have numbers, we have a survey, national statistics. The one I will spin on it, by the way, is that I just went through insurance reports. Our major insurance company that supports us in the bicycling community has said that helmets are not required for insurance benefits on road type, gravel type cycling. They are suggested, in fact, required for mountain bike rides. So I'm just saying, even nationally, there is not, from an insurance perspective, they are not pushing. Bottom line, we have many things to do around the state to implement safer activities. I don't believe this law, 1621, is to our benefit. And to the point of our friends on the motorcycle training group, and I work with them over the Department of Safety over the years, I just like to close with one little quote that I've been expounding for years. It's more important to have something in your head than on it. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Otherwise, any questions from the committee? Representative Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just to clarify, the bill before us still includes bicyclists. We have not accepted any amendment to take it out at this point. Okay, thank you for that clarification. You know where we stand in the bicycle community. I'm only speaking for bicyclists too. I'm not speaking for the motorcycle community, but I can only speak for the bicyclists. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Just to let me get organized here for a second. You're Mr. Winston, is that right? Yes. All right, hold on, sir. Next person up after him would be a Raymond Simonson. Go ahead, sir. Introduce okay. yourself and where you're from. Uh, my name is Bill Lipscott. I'm from uh, New Boston, New Hampshire. I've been riding motorcycles for 53 years. This helmet law issue was declared unconstitutional in the state of Illinois. Now I ask, do we have 50 United States or 50 separate countries? There are 30 states that don't require adults to wear helmets. As a matter of fact, there's two states that don't require helmets at all. Since uh, New York State enacted its first helmet law the first year they had a 75% uh, death rate from snap necks. And then the people that don't ride are the people telling you you got to wear a helmet. In South Dakota they were going to pass a helmet law and the people said well, you know, uh, they didn't want the helmet law during the Sturgis because it was going to cost the state too much money, losing all that money. So they were told it was either that or nothing, and they voted to have nothing. And we have to remember that it was the motorcyclists that started the rider education courses, that teach the motorcyclists how to ride motorcycles, how to avoid an accident, how to get out of an accident. Whereas the state, they'd rather just see you have a safer crash. I noticed the first time I was riding without a helmet in Connecticut, that I could hear the car on the left side of me, the tires hitting the tar strips on the road. Now I know, had I been wearing a helmet, I would have never known that car was there. So that was a safety factor for that. Today people ask me, well, what is it about the helmet you don't like? And I say, it's not about the helmet, it's about the choice. I think we all need our freedom, just like the freedom of our vets fought for in World War II, fought and died. How can we turn our backs on those principles now? I'm asking everyone to vote against this bill, and I appreciate you for your taking your time. And does anyone have a question? Any questions from the committee? 
Representative St. Clair. Thank you. Crystal uh, Zig, sir. Sir. Uh, one quick well, question. My hearing is very bad, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, real quick question. You, you mentioned your hearing, uh, that a helmet impacts that. What about your peripheral vision? What was the helmet? What? Your peripheral vision. Oh, my side vision, I don't know, it wasn't, I, I can't say that I noticed that in particular. The main thing I noticed was the tires and the fact that I was able to determine that there was a car to my left in my blind spot, which, like I say, you know, I wouldn't have known the car was there. Had I been wearing a helmet, I wouldn't have heard it. So I think that's just a safety issue to consider. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other members? Any members of the committee have further questions? Thank you, sir. You know, Mr. Simonson? Yes, I am. Okay. Emre Sauter, I'm not sure I said that right. You'll be next. Go ahead, sir. Yes, my name is Raymond Simonson from Laconia, business owner, and uh, wouldn't uh, be here if it weren't for me surviving a motorcycle incident 40 years ago. I was cut off face first into a telephone pole. Perhaps if I were wearing a helmet, it wouldn't look like it does today. However, I survived it and uh, wanted to put aside the time today to come and, and express my opinion. Uh, as I was walking up to the state house, which was my first time in this building, I couldn't help but I actually got goosebumps. As I, I see the statues of the men who gave their life for freedom, I, I see the pictures on the wall, and for me it was a first experience, so it was thrilling. And I, and I just hope that for those who are coming here on a daily basis to do their job for us, you're not becoming complacent. You're remembering that people gave their lives for freedom. And that was one point I knew would come up today. But I also know there's, there's fiscal responsibility in your job. And we have to look at how this is going to affect us financially. We've heard people come forward, this is about insurance and this and that, the numbers come out. 15,000 people, one death. The people through that course paid three hundred dollars a piece. That's four and a half million dollars generated for the state through the safety course, which entitles us to be free and make our own decisions, make our own safety decisions. But if you are going to put money up against it, I own a business in Laconia. I personally get up every day and I sweat, and I work like everybody else in here. But one thing I do that many in here don't do is I deliver food tax to this state. And if we do the math on how much is generated by the food and lodging taxes, it far outweighs these arguments of putting up the fiscal responsibility and how we get this money for this grant or that. It comes down to how much the motorcycles bring. I watch the people come into my, my driveway during bike week. I have a sense for how many are wearing a helmet and how many are not. Most of them aren't wearing a helmet. It's a beautiful state to ride bikes, and I just want to express that if you don't oppose this bill, you'll hurt me financially. For every dollar I personally gain for the state, I get 10 more dollars that I can pay my employees with, I can pay for the other things that the circuit and the community that my business relies on. So please get considered to this both from a position of freedom and fiscal responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the committee for the gentleman? Let's make sure before you Head on out. You're enjoying the experience, so let's go along. <laughs> Any members from the committee? Any questions? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Sorry, folks. I have Mr. Sauter next, and after him, Mr. Wood, uh, Don Wilson. Go ahead, sir. Chairman Sykes, Vice Chairman O'Brien, 
and members of the House Transportation Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony in opposition to House Bill 1621, legislation that would mandate compliant helmet use for all on and off highway riders and passengers on motorcycles, electric bicycles, mopeds, and bicycles. My name is Emery Sauter. I am a resident of the town of Carroll, New Hampshire, and I am on the board of directors of the New Hampshire Motorcyclist Rights Organization, also known as NHMRO. I am also a former motorcycle safety instructor with 40 years of on-street riding experience. I'll summarize my testimony. Each of you has a written copy in front of you to move these proceedings along. Let me begin by stating that the NHMRO and its members do not oppose helmet use. We oppose the mandate that all riders and passengers wear a helmet under all circumstances. There is a clear distinction between mandatory and voluntary helmet use. Currently, 29 states, including New Hampshire, provide adult choice for qualified riders and passengers, while 19 states mandate motorcycle helmet use for all riders and passengers. Two states do not require helmets of motorcyclists of any age. NHMRO has never discouraged a motorcyclist who chooses to wear a helmet. A compliant helmet is but one item of personal protective equipment available to motorcyclists to reduce risk of injury resulting from a crash. But mandated helmet use alone does not prevent a crash from taking place and does nothing to address the causes of crashes involving motorcycles. The fact remains that the safest motorcycle crash is the one that never happens. That's why we believe it's a far better use of precious resources to take a collaborative approach to traffic safety in which all parties with an interest in reducing crashes are at the table. Currently, NHMRO joins with the Office of Highway Safety, New Hampshire State Police, New Hampshire Rider Education Program, New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association, and iHeart Media to formulate ways we can reach all, way, all roadway users to encourage them to make informed decisions regarding their safety. I serve as director of the NHMRO Developed Ride Smart Program, which seeks to make New Hampshire roadways safer for all users. Our program encourages five principles of vehicle operation, safely as in unimpaired and undistracted, maturely as in operating within your skill level, aware in knowing your surroundings, respectfully as in respect for yourself and others, and trained as in obtaining formal training to supplement experience. Historically, New Hampshire has recognized that its adult residents and visitors, not the government, are best qualified to make decisions for themselves. While each decision may not lead to a positive outcome, it is far wiser for us to recognize risk and make choices than to contemplate others making those choices for us. Prior to retiring and moving to New Hampshire, I was afforded the opportunity to serve on a traffic fatality review board in Franklin County, Ohio. The county is home to the state capital, Columbus, and almost 1.1 million residents. For calendar year 2013, we reviewed in detail 75 traffic fatalities, including motorcyclists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. The insight I gained during each meeting, which included representatives from the emergency, education, engineering, enforcement, medical, and roadway user communities was that each fatal crash was unique and there is no such thing as a silver bullet in traffic safety. Reducing traffic crashes requires hard work with input and cooperation from all parties. In conclusion, let me again state that the NHMRO does not oppose motorcycle helmet use. On the contrary, we encourage its voluntary use as part of a comprehensive program to traffic safety. The issue that NHMRO has with House Bill 1621 is that it takes away a choice that adults have been free to make for many years in the Grand State. On behalf of the NHMRO and its members and all adult motorcyclists who reside or visit New Hampshire and believe that informed choice is a basic right in a free society, 
I respectfully request you oppose the House Bill 1621. Let's focus our precious financial and personnel resources on activities that make New Hampshire roadways safer for all users. Thank you again for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the committee? Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for coming and, and bringing up the statistics on fatalities. One of the things that I've been wrestling with is conflating the issues where, so a motorcyclist is in an accident and they die, and we're not wearing a helmet. Do you believe that the data that's available chunks that out to show the causal link that that was the reason for the fatality, or do they just include it? You know, like if, well, 50% of them are wearing wedding rings, so obviously if we don't wear those anymore, then you know, fatalities will go down. Do you know anything about that? Chairman Sykes, uh, Representative Smith, thank you for the question. With regard to that, I will say that the media has an obligation to report uh, traffic fatalities, and they traditionally do. Whether the person is wearing a helmet or not is traditionally included in crashes involving motorcycles. Uh, what I will say is that based on my experience and having the opportunity to talk with the county coroner over a period of four years, I learned that there were many crashes where indeed some uh, level of injury might have been prevented, but in the, in the totality of it, the blunt force trauma, the amputation of the leg, the breaking of the neck, whether it was a pedestrian, a motorcyclist, or a car driver, would have meant that kind of protection would have yielded nothing for them. So it's been my experience overall that while this is reported and it's, it's traditionally emphasized as news reports, that's one of the things that the news media does in cooperation with the government is to report helmet usage and seatbelt usage in fatal crashes. Thank you, sir. Any other questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Wilson, I take it? Yes. All right, hold on, sir. Uh, next up would be Tracy Borovitz. And Ms. Borovitz, I see that you represent the same organization whom we just heard from, so try to confine your remarks to something new for us, okay? When it's your turn. Representative, uh, excuse me, Mr. Wilson, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Don Wilson. I'm a Concord resident, and I oppose this bill because I believe in safety. Uh, the reason I say that is uh, I've been riding a motorcycle over 50 years, and um, I wear a seatbelt when I drive a car. And I have auto insurance, and I have motorcycle insurance. The reason I don't like to wear a helmet is because my peripheral vision and my hearing is dramatically improved by not wearing a helmet. I have successfully avoided accidents a number of times uh, by hearing cars coming up behind me that didn't see me and getting out of the way. And that is uh, the main reason. I, I have helmets and I wear them when I have to, but that is why I don't. Thank you, sir. Questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you, sir. After Ms. Borovays, I have Robert Baker, I think is the name. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman Sykes, committee members. My name is Tracy Borovage. I'm the president of New Hampshire Motorcycle Rights Organization. You're, you're it's okay. It's all right that you messed it up. Um, so you heard as adults, we deserve the right to choose. Obviously, that's an argument that our organization would make. You heard Emory Sauter, who's one of our board members, talk to you about our Ride Smoke Smart program. I just want to touch real quickly. You do have my testimony before you. You have our Ride Smart program before you in my testimony. This is a very important thing in New Hampshire that we're working on with several state agencies. He mentioned all of them. Please look at that. It's the first time ever that we're doing this. We are working towards safety. So it is important that you understand motorcyclists are working with agencies within this state to make it safer for riders. That's important that you hear that. 
Our organization also has worked with Emory and myself, the driver's education instructors, with our Ride Smart program. We are using the smart part of our program and taking it further than just motorcycles. They're now going to incorporate it to drivers. Once again, if you look at that that you have before you and you read what SMART stands for, riding safely, maturely, aware, respectfully, and trained, and we apply it to others on the roadways with motorcyclists, we can make our roads safer, which can cut down on crashes and fatalities. I attached also to my testimony, you'll see, there's an article in the Union Leader in which Dartmouth Hitchcock warned of ski helmet limitations. It says, and I've highlighted it for you, that helmets give skiers a false sense of security. How is this no different for motorcyclists? Because we also believe in our safety, we've done something else this year for the first time in New Hampshire. We're working with the task force in HMRO along again with the state police, the Office of Highway Safety, the Motorcycle Riders Training Program, and the Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association. A task force to work on safety in this state. Like, that's, that's big, that's important. I've also attached to my testimony, a testimony from Matt Danielson. He's an attorney who would have liked to have been here today but he's in Washington, D.C., fighting legislation as well. He's an attorney for motorcyclists. He's also the executive director of Virginia Coalition of Motorcyclists. He speaks on a national level about the burden and safety. You have his testimony before you, and he is damn good at what he does. He talks about the burden and the safety issues about motorcyclists. So I encourage you to read that testimony from him because that's what he does nationally. I want to end by telling you that NHMRO, our members, we are freedom fighters. We are voters. Many of us, many of these people in here, you've heard today are veterans. Veterans that fought for my freedoms, your freedoms, their freedoms, our country's freedoms. Freedoms that should not be taken away. This is a freedom. This is a choice. It is a right that we should have to choose as an adult about wearing a helmet. So I encourage you when you're making your decision to remember what our country was founded on and our forefathers who fought for that freedom originally. And I respectfully ask that you oppose this bill and do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. We have some questions, if you don't mind. Representative Terosian was first. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, ma'am, for taking my question. We've heard some testimony today that uh, some writers believe that peripheral vision in hearings is better without the helmet, impairing that. Have you, has your group done any studies, or have you ever a opinion on whether that indeed would uh, help make a, a writer safer? I will say, um, speaking on behalf of this group, so I've been a motorcycle for years, and I've been a lady who's a motorcycle who's been needed to have a child. Uh, I got back into it several years ago. I took the rider education course again, and they do, part of that, they have to do your personal vision. What I found for myself, and this is just me speaking personally, I have excellent <coughs> personal vision, and, and I remember talking with the very first guy who was talking about this way back here. When I put on a helmet, it is very distracting for me. Again, my personal view. But for me, when I'm wearing a helmet, if I have to look to see what I'm looking, where's my eye? Back here. But if my eyes can be here, all around me, absolutely. For me, that's a personal choice. Do you have a follow-up, Representative? Thank you, Chairman. It's a follow-up. So, for people that do have better perfect vision and can hear better with a helmet, 
That's an individual choice, but that would be safer than for those, those individuals to be able to ride without a helmet then. Would you uh, concur? Thank you, and I have Representative Connolly next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Borobosh. Thanks for your testimony. Something I've been curious about throughout this hearing is just the number of people in this voluntary environment who already wear helmets, and I'm wondering if that's... Thank you for coming. Folks, I'd ask you to take a seat and settle down so we can continue. Thank you. We left off with... A question from one of the representatives. I don't know if he wants to ask the question again. Representative Conley, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've uh, asked my question of the, the speaker, but I'll uh, ask it again in case anyone has the same question. Um, it was really just asking, do we know in the state a ballpark on what percentage of riders wear helmets under the current voluntary environment? And, Mr. Speaker, this is not working. So we do not, we do not take a poll. Um, and most of for us, it's just an issue of we just believe the right to choose. So there's not been something that we thought was important to decide whether or not who has numbers, who doesn't, who has numbers, who does not. And if we do not have the numbers, who has numbers, who has numbers. And I would say that most of us, for me, I think, unfortunately, does have a helmet in my house because I love somebody else, I do have to wear a helmet. But, you know, so you may have people that have helmets. Any other questions from the committee? Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming today and taking our questions. I have a question about the testimony provided uh, from Mr. Danielson. Now, earlier in the day, we heard the CDC recommendation that helmets save lives, yet it looks like you sent a request to the CDC asking for information about motorcycle fatalities for body part injuries, specifically head injuries, and that they said that they were unable to provide that and know of no entity that tracks it. Can you confirm that that's, that's what I'm reading here? That's correct. And that, and that thing, I can only speak, but I asked him to give you testimony. He was going to be here today, and his legislative hearing got changed from last week to this particular day, and he was going to be here today. when I don't. And there are reasons for that. 
And I would urge you to reconsider what the barriers are when you require people to have a helmet when they ride. Now, I can't speak for the motorcyclists in the room. I wasn't here for the whole testimony, and I can't speak to that. But I can speak to the bicyclist. There are a few people, maybe a 5% of us, who ride like me. I will ride anywhere, anytime, in any traffic. There are another maybe 15, 20% of people who will ride, but they're scared. And then there are about 60% of the population who would really like to ride, but you know, it's too dangerous out there. The roads are dangerous, there's not a safe place to ride, there are distracted drivers, and it's just plain scary. And then there's maybe 15% who would never ride a bike anytime, anyhow, and some of you may be in that. Some of you may be part of that 60%. So we have a lot of barriers already. In fact, I can't even park at the state house here because there are no bike racks. That's a barrier to my transportation form. But let me tell you, when I'm out there riding every single day, I would say that about 20% of the drivers I don't have statistics other than what I can calculate in my mind. 20% of the drivers are on their cell phones and they're distracted. That is, a, that is a larger problem to safety than whether or not I wear a helmet. It's that distracted driver piloting sometimes several ton vehicles. Most vehicles are a ton and a half. Some vehicles are four or five tons. And when those people are on the road and they're driving next to me, it scares me to death. And I've had incidents, a, a, a year ago, I was riding up Loudon Road, two pickup trucks came past me so close that it scared the bejeebus out of me. The meeting I went to, but the back of my neck started itching. And over the next two weeks, what do you think happened? Shingles. It scared me so much that I developed shingles. Now that's a safety issue when people on the roads are driving so distracted. Now whether or not I wear a helmet, if they hit me and I go down and hit my head on the pavement, yeah, maybe it'll save me a little bit. But why don't we focus, instead of saying, let's everybody wear a helmet, why don't we focus on the real issues here? The safer infrastructure so that people can choose. That 60% of people who are afraid to use our roads, telling them that, oh, and now you have to wear a helmet. So where's the equity in that, right? Think about that. I'm one of the 60% of the people. I'd like to ride a bike, maybe I don't have a helmet. Maybe I'm going two blocks away. But now the state is telling me I have to wear a helmet to ride. Now I told you that I ride my bike oftentimes with a helmet. There are some times when I run to the store and it's a relatively safe route and I feel confident enough that I don't need to wear a helmet. The last thing I want to do is worry about a police officer who might have the opportunity to come up and ticket me because you're not wearing a helmet. And at the same time, 20% of the drivers are driving around distracted. I mean, this is an equity issue. This is about providing people a space so they can choose to ride a bicycle, to do something other than get in their automobile and pilot that. So I urge you to reconsider, what are we doing here? What are the barriers that we really ought to be fixing? I think you ought to be focusing on how can we stop that distracted driving? And just drop this whole helmets issue, because really, if we have the knowledge in our head, we're gonna wear our helmet when it makes sense, but we shouldn't have to live in fear of a police officer finding us because we're not wearing a helmet. That should be our personal choice. After all, this is New Hampshire, live free or die. So I urge you to please reconsider and focus your attention as a transportation committee on really what are the things that are gonna make it easier for that 60% of people to get out there on the road instead of creating another barrier. One last fact I wanna give you. Seattle, Washington, as a municipality, has passed a helmet law and they had a bike share system in Seattle. Guess which one failed? The bike share failed. Why? A lot of us think it's because there was this requirement to wear a helmet. 
Now, bike share gets people out of their cars. It limits the, co the congestion. We gave, Seattle gave up bike share because this, the municipality said we have to wear helmets all the time. And I urge you to reconsider that. Let's make New Hampshire a more welcoming place for people who want to choose other transportation. And let's focus on issues that really make sense. Safety, the distracted driver. With that, I'll end. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Representative Tarosian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. So I, I think what I've heard here today so far is that one size doesn't fit all riders and cyclists. Uh, that uh, the individual having the choice to decide what's best for them in the long run is, is, would be the safest way to handle this. Currently, uh, anyone that wants to wear a helmet can. In some do, in certain cases, and other times they, they choose not to. And that's their right for them to do that. So leaving the personal choice, in your opinion, do you think is the safest way to go forward? Number one, number two, focusing on perhaps those of us here at the State House focusing more on reducing distracted driving would be the best way forward for safety. I think what I heard you restate is correct. I think that I shouldn't have to worry about going out and riding about who's going to pull me over, because really, frankly, it's easier to enforce a helmet law than it is a distracted telephone law. And so, what's the incentive if an officer has the opportunity to find me, and then I have to worry one more barrier to ride on a bike? Yes, that's that's a backwards thinking. I think. And guys, please focus on the infrastructure. Put in bike routes here at the state house. Simple things, easy. Cheap things, they're cheap to, to support bicycle infrastructure. It's really cheap, but you have to have the leadership that says this is important and we're gonna do this. Otherwise, it will never happen. And the cities who are doing this stuff, people are, are, are that's where people wanna live. You know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Seattle, Washington, Boston, even some small, even Keene is doing things. So here, I mean, I know this is the whole state, but. We can do a lot more to make, um, to really go towards that vision zero where nobody gets hurt, but not by telling people to wear helmets. Thank you. Representative Smith is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for taking our questions. I'm curious about something. I like to know how things work. So the, the bike share program, if you have one of those, and then they pass a helmet law. I mean, how does it work? Do people, if they're going to use the service, have to carry their own helmets around, or does a helmet stay with the bike and you got to wear someone else's helmet, which seems, I don't know, nasty. My understanding is Seattle tried to work around this, this law, the municipal law, it wasn't a state law, to provide helmets. And what do you do? Well, you've been to the airports now, and you have, you can buy a, uh, electronic devices in a vending machine. So they tried vending machines, but frankly, it failed. People weren't going to wear a helmet. They didn't want to. And so the bike share lost customers, and eventually they went out of business. They couldn't stay in business. So it, there was no solution, really. I have Representative Nicole Klein. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking my question. In the interest of uh, helping you and other supporters of other transportation, I'm just curious, where did you put your bike today? Right, well, good question. So, thankfully, around the State House, because we have to mark off the parking for you all, uh, there are still some parking meters. And so when Concord had parking meters downtown, I had hundreds of bike parking places. And that's what I use today. But I'll tell you, the state of Minnesota, they have bike racks right next to their state house. Right <laughs> next to it. Like right up next to the building. All right, thank you. Thank so, you. Now, um, is there anyone who had intended to speak in 
reference to this bill who has not had the opportunity to do so. Okay, seeing none. What? Sorry, who what? Sir, come down to the microphone, please. And before you leave, you'll have to, would you please fill out a pink card for us? And tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm Stephen. My name is Steve Allison. Uh, I'm from Manchester. I'm also one of the founders of the Ride for the Fall Center. I come from a state that at one time did have a mandatory helmet law, which, in a sense, failed. They implemented it in 1972 or 73. They had it for 13 years. Motorcycle registration in that state dropped by half. The year they removed the mandatory helmet law, motorcycle uh, registrations doubled from the highest previous year ever. It brought more money into the in there. Yet motorcycle deaths did not raise it. A helmet will protect you up to a certain speed. It will also, uh, you know, it does give you a false sense of security, which does cause some people to ride a little more aggressive. I myself, I, I wear a helmet on occasion. I rode my bike in today. I wore my helmet. Why? Because my ears didn't freeze otherwise. But it was my choice to wear that. I've been riding with an endorsement since 1978. My father's been riding since 1953. He made me own a motorcycle before I could ever own a car to teach me how to be observant on the road, how to be a, a better car, uh, a car operator than a little motorcycle rider. So I'm more observant. The biggest problem is not whether we have a helmet on our head to keep us safe. The biggest problem is the people that aren't aware of the surroundings. And that's not only the motorcyclists, but also the, uh, the people out in the car. A day does not go by that I don't see, I don't know how many people on the phones, texting, looking at it, trying to bring up the GPS while driving. The day that they implemented the, uh, the no text law in New Hampshire a few years ago, I'm driving through Cookson. Here is a marked white state of New Hampshire Department of Safety vehicle with a lady driving it, texting while she's driving. You're not even enforcing the laws that we have on the book. You want to add another burden on everybody else. I don't go to Massachusetts. I don't go to Vermont. Why? Because they have a mandatory helmet law. I don't always have the helmet with me. I don't want to have to be burdened by stopping and putting a helmet on just so I can go, to, go there. I much rather right here or right in Maine. They don't have a helmet law. This is a state of freedom. We have constitutional character. We don't have a seatbelt law. You know, we don't need a helmet law. All it is is going to be a bigger burden. Uh, you talk about uh, the people that were uh, that died not wearing a helmet by a motorcycle. I want you to uh, somebody to do a research to find out how many of those accidents, fatal accidents, you know, versus people wearing helmets and people not wearing helmets, that death was going to happen anyway because it was that traumatic of an accident whether it's head injury or damage to the body. People don't look at the underlying incidents, why these people were killed. The seven that died out there in the corner, they did not, you know, they had their helmets on, yet there were seven dead people. And it wasn't their fault. And it wasn't because they had, had a choice whether they wear their helmet or not wear it. It's because of some other influence. It's those other influences that are the problem. It's not whether we wear a helmet or not. Now, all these people in this room, I don't know but maybe a couple of them, but this is my family. These are my brothers and my sisters, and there's nothing I can do more than to look out for them. But by looking out for them, it doesn't mean, hey, you have to wear your helmet. No, it's to be, if we're right in a group, looking around, keeping an eye on everything happening around me. If there's somebody that's riding back, to let them know. If there's an obstacle, to let them know. 
That's where the safety comes in, not from the head. Thank you, sir. Okay, so. Um, Thank you, sir. State your name, where are you from? My name is Douglas Hayes, I'm from Stratford. Um, I'm a motorcycle rider. I've been riding for the last 35 years, since I was 16 years old. In fact, I rode dirt bikes since I was seven years old. Uh, I worked at NHIS um, on the ambulance crew down there. Um, I also worked for the Stratford Fire Department for many, many years. Uh, I had 20 years of service in. I just want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up on some of the medical side of things. Helmets, to a point, will help. They will not stop the brain injuries. The helmets are a low speed impact protection. If you get hit something at 40, 50 miles an hour, your brain hits the inside of your skull. That is where the damage comes that causes the problems. Um, I've, I've taken, you know, racing motorcycle guys up here at Concord Hospital with brain injuries, and, we, and they wear helmets when they race. Um, I've gone to motorcycle accidents in my town I've gone to motorcycle accidents that I've just shown up on the scene that happened to be there and I've, and I've helped. Um, that have had helmets on and those people have died. 90% I would say died from other internal injuries. When you're on a motorcycle and you're going 40, 50 miles an hour, you've got your heart tears away from your aorta, you get lung, punctured lungs from broken ribs and stuff like that. Again, you know, you're on a motorcycle. You don't have protection. These guys on the races, they have full leathers and stuff like that that keep them from sliding. Um, my thoughts are the only thing that a helmet is going to help you determine in a high-speed accident whether it is going to be whether you have an open casket or a closed casket. Thank you, sir. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I, I know you can't read that. Yeah, I can't read your last name, sir. I, I'm looking for Max. Yeah, Max Dakota, yeah. How you doing? Uh, what's your last name, sir? What Nicosia. is your last name? Nicosia, N-I-C-O-S-A. <laughs> Sorry, could you start this? Just, we're at the end of a long day. You got something new for us? That's great. Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you, board and uh, representatives. Um, I'm, a, I'm a post this bill, uh, like most others here. Um, a couple things that I want to touch on real quick uh, is I want to reiterate that the distraction law, I think the representatives could spend more time on that. I also own a truck company, I'm on the road, I have two trucks, I have a 100,000 pound truck, track and trail that I drive every day. I also have a triax dump truck that is 76,000 pounds. I got rear rented uh, on a side road, completely stopped later on from a distracted driver. The poor girl didn't even see me. My only half she had to see if she didn't because she was on her phone. Luckily, she survived this, but it was bad when she had it to myself. If I was on my bike, I'm on a knot, it would have been bad. Okay. In and out of Boston three times a day, I see distracted driving all day long. I've been in a motorcycle accident. I did not have a helmet. I bounced 150 feet on a scratch of my head. Because I had the education and I had the training. And I get in an accident, you know what to do. I had broken ribs, I had foot backwards, but I didn't have a scratch in my head. So I would beg you again, just like everybody else, please don't take our free bullet. Let it be our choice. Most of us are educated. The ones that are not will seek the education and the training to offer property. That's it. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Gagne, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, <clears throat> you talked about distracted driving. Are you aware that there is a law in the books about distracted driving? We just legislate. Would you believe that we just legislate law enforcement are the ones that are supposed to enforce it? Unfortunately, I don't think there's enough law enforcement, and I don't think the law is strict enough. The amount of stuff that I see on a daily basis, I'll guarantee you, seven out of ten drivers are distracted. They're on the phones, they're doing video tasks, they're watching movies all day long. It's sad, and it's scary. Anything further? Thank you, sir. We are apparently going to have one more speaker. Mike, can we get him on? Representative O'Brien, can you find a card for this gentleman? Hi, my name is James Apostles, I live in Alexandria. I oppose this bill. I just wanted to, I heard earlier about the media reporting deaths and motorcycle helmets to this stuff. All I want to know is, I've been here for 17 years. Snowmobile killed, wasn't running out. Motorcycles killed, wasn't running out. In 17 years, I have not heard one story on the major news network where they come and say, John Q. Smith got killed, he had a helmet on, damn it. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to get your information. Don't listen to the news broadcast, because everybody getting killed isn't wearing a helmet. And we know people wearing helmets get killed all the time, like the 74 people that fall in seven, they were all wearing helmets. Did you hear it on the news? No. Why? It doesn't fit their agenda to take our freedom. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative St. Clair, are you going to ask a question that will help add to the debate, I hope? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, your comments about they don't say they're wearing a helmet. Have you ever seen a news report where they actually said what the cause of death was other than what they were wearing or not wearing? I don't think so. Maybe one fourth trauma would be something. That's about it. Right. Back on one force trauma. But usually, if, he's, if the person, unfortunately, is deceased and was wearing a helmet, you don't hear about it. If he wasn't wearing a helmet, it's front page. Okay, but I was just asking about the cause of death. Thank you very Most much. Most of it, my brother was killed on his motorcycle. He was wearing a helmet. He got run over the stop sign by a drunk police officer, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so folks. First things first, um, I would like you all to pass messages along. A lot of people have not been able to stay for the whole day. I'd like you to pass along messages that it's much appreciated by the Transportation Committee that you all took time out of your day to come and talk about this bill with us. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. As a final note, just so people know, we had 259 people sign in in opposition to the bill and four in favor. And with that, I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 1621.